Welcome Pacifica family and honored guests. My name is Braden Steiner and I have the pleasure of serving as a prefect for The Great Conversation and as a senior at Pacifica. The Great Conversation is an opportunity for Pacifica to reach out to the community by entering into the debates that we have within our society today and encouraging us to think and live well in context of what we have learned. We, the Pacifica student body, who I can affectionately call family, have been formed into people of character and are in the process of doing so from the period of freshman year to senior year. Along our journey together, we have grown as we have examined our lives through the investigation of the truth that we have learned from people as they have discovered it from the past. Pacifica helps develop young men and women into people who are prepared and are ready to enter the next phase of their lives as people who are armed with truth and ready to extend grace to those in their environment and to introduce them into the conversation that we begin today. It is for this reason that we have gathered. Today we have the pleasure of continuing this conversation with some insight as it pertains to constitutionalism through the perspective of Winston Churchill. We welcome today Mr. Keith Carlson, a board member here at Pacifica Christian, and Dr. Larry Arne, the president of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with, here with us today. As a very eloquent and motivating speaker, Churchill served as a clarifying light in the darkness during the time of the Second World War for Great Britain. Because of his love of his country and his desire for their freedom, he was a driving force in the resistance against the Axis powers. A very experienced orator, Churchill advocated for the constitutional form of government as the primary political method for achieving freedom. He also argued that the preservation of such government promotes freedom and that it is necessary for civilization to thrive. It was arguably his great courage that saved Western civilization from tyranny. Constitutionalism advocates for rule through the consent of the governed. A government so conceived is limited in its powers based on the powers given to it by the people. In Mr. Balmer's ethics and politics class at Pacifica, Pacificans learn about such thinkers as John Locke and Montesquieu. These men greatly contribute to this constitutional idea of government, and we owe them respect for it to the extent that we have succeeded. Amen. Their ideas regarding separation of powers, limited government, and what it means for government to benefit the people have shaped the government that we have today. In Reverend Stratton's faith and culture class, which all seniors will take, we have learned that every human being is motivated by self-interest to some degree. What best meets their needs or their wants. Constitutionalism has met our needs thus far. Because of its structure and because of its practice, it has unified our desire for greatness and limits our power to destroy ourselves because of our wretchedness. Our country has been saved great internal conflict from our form of government. And it is because it is so significant that we meet here today. It is not a given that government will continue if we fail to defend it. Winston Churchill defended it. The live question now today is, will we? I would like to introduce Mr. Keith Carlson to begin our discussion and to introduce our speaker today. Mr. Carlson is an attorney and a founding partner of Carlson and Jaya Kumar in Newport Beach. Mr. Carlson has an extensive experience on school board management at all levels of education, including the boards of both Whittier and Chapman Law Schools. The Board of Advisors for Pacifica Santa Monica and now as the Chairman for the Board of Pacifica Orange County. He and his wife Amy live in Huntington Beach with their four children, two who attend Pacifica, one who attends Huntington Christian School and his oldest attends the University of Notre Dame. Please welcome Keith Carlson. Thank you so much, Braden. I want to begin our time uh, with this TGC in a word of prayer, if you'd join me. Glory and praise to you, Lord of light, perfection of beauty, splendor of majesty, brilliance of wisdom, bright holiness, deep mystery, refining fire. Shine upon us with the radiance of your face and the warmth of your blessing. Let us reflect the light you give and be a light to the nations so that all the earth may know your glory. To you, O God, we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, as you hopefully know, TGC is the great conversation, a part of what we do at Pacifica Christian High School. And I want to thank David O'Neill, Kathy Mellert, Jana DeMotz, our student ambassadors, uh, and the entire Pacifica team for putting on another great TGC event. 
We have over 200 people attending today, and there was a very long wait list, list, wait list behind you. So thank you so much to the Pacifica team. I thank you uh, for attending and uh, hope you enjoy our conversation today. It is a central part of Pacifica's mission to bring the great conversation across various topics and throughout the centuries, not only to our students each day in the classroom, but also to you, our community at large. We uh, have, will have another uh, TGC in the spring and then an, again in the fall. We would invite you to help us spread the word. Let's have even more folks here next time. Probably not in this room because we are at fire code capacity, I think. <laughs> the topics are rarely the same for our TGC discussions, but the content is always wonderful. And uh, you might be asking, so what exactly is this great conversation? A few years ago, uh, one of our very first Pacifica students commented that our school shouldn't be known just for reading old books. And he couldn't be more right. We want to read great books, even if they're old. We want to know them. We want to be able to communicate their timeless ideals and then use those ideals for the, our own betterment, but also the betterment of our world. We want to learn more in order to both live better lives and also to love our neighbors more completely. And who better to learn from than the greatest thinkers, even if they are old? But this is not just a time for us to learn uh, from the great thinkers, but to actually interact with the ideas they've brought forward. Today, we're going to take a look at the life and ideas of Winston Churchill to improve both the way we think and live. And even if you disagree with him, you'll be better for the encounter. Who was Churchill? What influenced him? What were his ideas on civilization and on the threats to it? What is the best way for a people to govern itself? Were his views correct at, in his time? And do they remain true in our time? If they are true, how do we apply his teachings to our life and to our world? This type of dialogue is central to Western society, even if it might go unnoticed in today's popular media. If nothing else, the West can be regarded as what happens over the years when a small tribe of Hebrew wanderers having a God unlike any of their neighbors, collides with a diverse group of Greek philosophers. Their ideas opened up a dialogue that has been rolling on and shaping our world ever since. Geographically, this happened in a backwater cul-de-sac of Asia that we call Europe. And from that, the West was born. And here we are today, downstream from our ancestors, but in the same current. Here's how the late Robert uh, Maynard Hutchins, who is the president of the University of Chicago, describes what we're doing. He said, the tradition of the West is embodied in the great conversation that began in the dawn of history and continues to the present day. His colleague, Mortimer Adler, said, the great thinkers and writers of the West are bound together in an intellectual community. In the works that come later in the sequence of years, we find thinkers listening to what their predecessors have had to say about this idea or that topic. And that's exactly what we want at Pacifica for our TGC program and for you, our guests, to be about today. Let us think, let's discuss, let's comment on and learn from what others have, to, have said. Today we uh, focus, uh, as Braden uh, mentioned, on a big question presented to all Pacifica seniors. How then shall we live? With Churchill, we can see the love of freedom, the role of constitutionalism, the ever-present threat of totalitarianism, and the need for both magnanimity as well as courage throughout our lives. Though we are blessed by one of the greatest Churchill scholars of our time, we believe we cannot merely attend the great lecture for a reason. For uh, us as audience members, we, we want to really enter in and we will do that in conversation. So there are cards as you've heard on your table and you can use it to draft a question for our Q&A portion. And with your questions, I will make a note. Uh, an old friend of both Dr. Arns and myself, a man by the name of Tom Fuentes reminds us, you cannot be both brief and bad with your questions. 
If you're not laughing, you need to think about that long and hard before you write a question. <clears throat> in connecting us with the great conversation of the West, we hope all you participating in this TG see event will uh, benefit both in knowledge and character, in grace and in truth, which is exactly what we hope for for our Pacifica students over their course of uh, four year studies with us. That knowledge, grace and truth is brought to us today by an outstanding speaker, an old friend. I first met Dr. Arn in 1999, and I think he first remembered me meeting some, sometime around 2004. <laughs> Never has a name tag ever been more useful in a friendship. <laughs> Dr. Arn serves as the 12th president of Hillsdale College, though founded in 1844, some 171 years before Pacifica's founding, Hillsdale was presciently, presciently able to predict what a school like Pacifica would be about, and then it aligned its mission with ours 170 years in advance. <laughs> Simply brilliant. That's just a humorous way of saying his school and Pacifica have much in common, though they've been at it for much longer than we. If you look at Pacifica and Hillsdale's core teachings, you will see great consistency. Both schools value thinking well, but so too do we value living well. Good ideas must be borne out in good actions and the good life. To that end, Pacifica holds itself out as a school for every neighborhood. And what we mean by that is that we want everyone who wants to be at Pacifica and receive that education to be able to do so, so we set aside a significant portion of our budget every year for financial aid for all qualified students to attend. Hillsdale also has a deep history in this regard. When founded in 1844, its charter documents were the first in our nation's history to teach both white and black, male and female. It was the second school in our country's history to admit women, and from its opening day, it admitted African, and Amer African Americans, which was an extreme rarity at the time. While I'm plugging uh, Hillsdale College, I should note a couple of things. One, that Pacifica's very first graduating class of 2018 sent a full 6% of its graduates to Hillsdale. I challenge Dr. Arn to find a higher percentage from any school in this country. And that 6% was Tanner Motsky, who was a sophomore and plays, and plays for Hillsdale's golf team right now. Point two. Hillsdale offers both its publication in Primus, which is like a TGC in pamphlet, pamphlet form, and numerous online courses, all for free to the public. Um, my family gets in Primus, we read it uh, every time, and we just finished Dr. Arn's online courses on Aristotle's ethics. I would commend everything they offer to the public to you for your enjoyment and growth. As for Dr. Arn, he studied at Arkansas State and then did his graduate studies here in California at the Claremont Graduate School and also at Worcester College in Oxford, England. While in Oxford, he was the director of research for Sir Martin Gilbert, who was Winston Churchill's official biographer. Dr. Arn went on to help found the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy. He served as the Institute's president from 1985 to 2000 when he took the helm at Hillsdale. I have the distinct pleasure of serving on the board of directors at the Claremont Institute alongside Dr. Arn, who is our vice chairman, which is not to say the chairman of vice. <laughs> Dr. Arn is author of three books, Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education, The Founder's Key, The Divine and Natural Connection Between the Declaration and the Constitution and What We Risk by Losing It, and Churchill's Trial, Winston Churchill and the Salvation of Free Government. Whether on education and the soul, our nation's founding and its founders, or on Winston Churchill and the defense of the West and free government, I can think of no one better than my friend and colleague to keep Pacifica Christian's great conversation going. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry Arn. I feel old. 
I don't know how old this club is, but I spoke here the first time three years before it was founded. <laughs> it's the same kind of chronology as Keith just used about the mission of Hillsdale College in Pacifica. And I feel old especially because Keith seems like a grown-up to me for the first time now. <laughs> and uh, he, he thinks I didn't remember his name for five years, but the truth is it wouldn't have been good for me to remember his name. <laughs> good for him to remember it. Uh, are the Motskis here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's not going to make it, I don't think. <laughs> And the Turnbull boy is having a terrible time. And uh, Lucy Cuneo, she's, you know, she's going to have a really rough time because Andrew there, who's now Father Cuneo, and an astonishment to me. <laughs> Why? Because uh, freshman used to get on his nerves. And he told me he was going to go be a priest. And I said, Lord, you're going to be a present, a parish priest, and freshmen annoy you? That's going to be nuts. <laughs> but he seems to like it. Anyway, we got Lucy, and he's a colleague of some of our best professors in English, and I said, uh, they're so excited to have Lucy, and I said, you know, there's favoritism here, and they all knew exactly what I meant. They said, yeah, she's going to have a really hard time. <laughs> That's our college. Um, okay, how many, are there Pacifica students here? Do they go back to school or something? Oh, yeah, the ones I met. Okay, and uh, Keith you know, made a big deal about the 6%, and the reason is he's ashamed of himself. <laughs> because his daughter, my friend's daughter, right, to whom I talked for an hour, went to the wrong college. <laughs> but Casey over there is not going to do that. And Tom Fuente's kid's not going to do that. And who's that girl who was with Harrison, is that her name? The one who said the prayer? Yeah, I got those four. They're all signed up. <laughs> all right. And I'm, that's why I'm here, you know. Friendship matters a lot. And if you pick the right friends, you'll find out 25 years later they're doing the right thing still. Not a surprise. OK, now I got four emails telling me what I'm going to address today, and they're all different. Uh, I, I think this has happened because of disorganization in my office. How could it not be? And because of Keith, because he knows everything I know and everything about me. So my topics today are Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill and the West, Winston Churchill and constitutionalism, and Winston Churchill and education. So. I will deal all with those quickly because they're closely related. Uh, in school, we learn to define things, don't we, kids? Half the battle is knowing what, what the dang thing is. What is that thing? That's Socrates' question, T. Esty. So I'm going to ask that question about those four things. First of all, what was Churchill? He was a statesman. What's that, Casey? Do you know? Type of politician, yeah, that's a, that's an Orange County kind of thing, you know, where there's <laughs> where there's conservatives about. We think that statesmen are good politicians, and they're not. They're the same thing. It's just they're good and bad ones of both. So here's here's what it is, and why we should be interested in it. Uh, most of our mental weather as human beings involves doing something that only we do, which is choose. We're not like the dogs. I have dogs in my family, so they're my they're. Uh, my example of the whole order of nature, non-human and non-divine. What, 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 you watch them, right? They hear something outside. They decide to go out and see what it is. You can watch them think which way to go. It depends on where they are. It depends on whether, which door they think is open. Circumstances. And those are different every time they choose. But then we have that too, right? Like. Should we beat those kids? Yes, it's good for them. But <laughs> it depends some on the kids. Like the reason that that was funny about beating those kids is that's a questionable thing to do. I'm not saying it's always wrong, but it's questionable. What makes it questionable? Where does that question come from? 
We're just like dogs. We've got to eat. We get tired. We want stuff. And yet something is nagging us. And it, it won't go away. And even, by the way, in the, modern, in the forms of modern philosophy that deny that there's any objective good, they always justify that philosophy on the ground that it is good. <laughs> you can't get away from it. And it's actually natural. It's even our capacity to see that as how we can talk and use common nouns. So our choosing is always torn between this stuff going on right now and this something else that colors what it would be right to do. The circumstances do, too. And that's most of what we do when we're thinking right now. It's not the highest kind of thinking. It's the typical and the most urgent kind of thinking. And we all need to get good at that, because we all got to figure out, you know, where are you going to send your kids to college? Even the Carlsons can get that wrong. <laughs> See? But, and the classics teach us that what statesmen are, by the way, are people who make those choices on a big scale with huge consequences in public and involving all of us. And he says, if you want to get good at that, you can get good at that from experience, which is an expensive teacher and takes a lot of time or you can study the people who are good at it. And that's mostly statesmen, he says. Aristotle says that. So he was a statesman. And then one more thing of particular interest about him. He's the greatest statesman of our time. And I have to tell you what our time is. Our time is the time when the most important fact in the world is the power of technology. Uh, war has been transformed. It can be utterly and instantly disastrous. We're not an island alone anymore. Uh, life, everything, it's all different. They can uh, just think what it means that uh, in Hong Kong, they know where everybody is all the time. Because the cops wear glasses. And just like cop cars here, record all the license plates as they drive down the road. If the, if the license plate is line of sight and goes into a computer bank, and that means we always know where your car is. Right. Do you see why? And they, the, the cops in, in China wear glasses like that now. So they go down the street and they recognize everybody. They know where you are all the time. Now, do you see why that's a, that's a quantitative change? That's enormous power that we didn't used to have. But it makes a qualitative change in a relationship. The change is that, uh, uh, well, I'll put it in the terms of the, the prime justification for the Constitution of the United States. What is government the profoundest of all commentaries on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be needed. If angels were to govern men, neither internal nor external controls would be needed. So that means the people in China, alas, they're just like us. And now they have this enormous power. Or put it in Winston Churchill's terms. Uh, mankind has never been in this position before without approving appreciably in virtue or enjoying wiser guidance he has got into his hands at last the means of his own destruction. Death stands waiting at attention, silent and expectant. Churchill could write, you know. Waiting for a word from the frail being so long his servant, now for once his master. That's our time. You, uh, I, I'm old now and I've lived around here for a long time and this has always been a favorite place of mine. And I've watched the changes in it. And there are changes in wealth, and there are changes in outlook. And not all the changes in outlook are happy. That's why Pacifica Christian is, in one way, a conquering force, and in another way, part of a besieged minority. And that's a sort of product of the fact that when power gets really big and collected, then people get really small. That's why interfering with you know, wh why, why does it happen that the federal government requires hundreds of pages of rules for every public school and every college that takes the government money in the land? At Hillsdale College, it's, it's 175 years old, and you know, it's pretty good. It's the man, as we say. And, uh, you know, 
And I'm just saying, come visit, I'll show you, right? But we, you know how many rules we have? For the students, we have 17 rules. They take up a page and a quarter. And for the faculty, we have a catalog that's mostly descriptions of the coursework, but the faculty and staff rules are about 12 pages. And if they were more than that, nobody could remember them. You see? Why hundreds of pages? Why from a central source? Because there's an effort to subject the entire society and everyone in it into a subject of the scientific method. If we can make everything uniform, then we can measure the results. We can even have control groups here and there. And that means rather than representing us, our government regards itself as experimenting upon us now. That's the time in which Churchill was born. What is the West? It is this very beautiful thing. And I, I think there may be nothing like it in the East. Uh, we've taken up an interest at Hillsdale College in Confucius of late. And we had a really great talk about Confucius from uh, Claremont professor Mark Blitz, an old friend of mine, came out to the campus and he's been working on Confucius, right? And uh, you know, if, if, you, if you know, if you know what you need to know, you know what's in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And I'm just finishing teaching this right now, next week, and it's just, it's a sublime experience. You, to go through that book, you gotta do it. Anyway, he compares the Analects of Confucius to Aristotle's Ethics. And what there is in, in the Analects is tradition and order and gentlemanliness. What there isn't is truth Nature, God. If you have both those things, it's exactly parallel to that thing I said about practical judgment and how we make our choices. There's practical stuff you gotta take account of, and there's some voice outside you that's talking to you all the time, calling you to be more like the divine. Western philosophy and the Christian faith an extension of the Jewish faith in this regard. They come together and they have that attribute. They both, Socratic philosophy. You know, I said about definitions, kids, right? Socrates' question is TSD. TSD, what is this? TSD, uh, what is the politique, the, the statesman, right? What is, what is, what is? And come to find out those questions are hard to answer because you have to, be, to give a fundamental answer now. And that, by the way, takes, it's one reason why it's so easy to torture the young and therefore delightful. <laughs> um, because you can only give clear and, and comprehensive definitions after you've thought about it for a long time. And the reason it's good to torture them is it shows them that's what they're supposed to be working on. And then their minds will learn. So th it's that revolution which ha happened earlier than that. You know, one God for every man, anywhere, every country, the maker, the eternal, the unchanging, the ultimate good, that's Yahweh. And there's not one before him like that, right? And once there is such a being and you identify such a being, all of a sudden, everything around you takes on a richness because you've got something to compare it to something abiding, something pure, something perfect. That's the West, the drive for that, the push for that. Constitutionalism. Well, first of all, isn't that a boring subject? Um, it took me a long time to figure out it was exciting. It, uh, and, and you know, I was, in the meantime, I was made to do it, like you kids are being made to do it, right? But, Turns out constitutionalism is just a deduction from the founding of the West. Why? Because all of a sudden now, how the rules are made and, how, and what the laws are, it's natural to human beings to make laws. Uh, all philosophy agrees on that except the crazy part lately. All the laws, you know, if you were, uh, well, read Herodotus, the first book of history. 
And in the first chapter, there's a conversation between Xerxes, who was a jerk, and a fool, and you know, led to his demise, and his chief general, Mardonius. And Mardonius doesn't want to go to fight these Greeks, because he's seen them. <laughs> and uh, here's how he disagrees with Xerxes. You are the greatest of all the rulers of Persia, and after you, there will never be a greater one. Now, isn't that stupid on its face? <laughs> I mean, he doesn't know that, right? And, and why did he say that? Because, but for, except for Xerxes, everybody else is a slave. You don't need a form of government. You don't need participation if that's how you're going to be governed. And actually, the question doesn't really arise if there's just a way it's always been done and that's the whole justification for it, as in, apparently, Confucius. Whereas in our case, it's just in Aristotle, consent of the government is not a doctrine in Aristotle. On the other hand, the rule that the, that the polity should act for the good of all the citizens, that that is its purpose, that argument is more than 2,000 years old, see? in the West. But if you're going to have it recommend, represent and, and work for the good of everyone, you're going to need some big rules about how decisions get made. And those rules are going to have to involve everyone, or at least everyone ruling. But that's only just if everyone ruling effectively represents the rest of them, because all men are created equal, in Aristotle as in Thomas Jefferson. So then you need these rules, and the rules need to be settled, and they need not to change. And I told you the justification for the Constitution of the United States. You know, you're, I don't know if you know, but there's some impeachment proceedings happening in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, I keep thinking they're going to bring it up on the news. But um, <laughs> oh, I'll say something to you kids. Nietzsche, who was crazy and brilliant, he wrote this. He said, until this generation, everybody read the Bible every day. Now everybody reads the newspaper. You know how we teach that it's a civic duty to read, to, to, to read the newspaper? I think it should be a crime. <laughs> it is a duty to know what's going on. But you can't get that out of the newspaper. That's, you know, what, what does journalism mean? It's from the French or the Latin, right? The news of the day, right? The news of the day has to be judged in light of something. That's that practical judgment thing, right? We're all members now of the church of what's happening now. So you have to have this constitutionalism. Now, Churchill. Churchill said this beautiful thing once about the West. He said, uh, uh, we, alive today, take our heritage from two cities, Jerusalem and Athens. Leo Strauss wrote that, too. Um, he said, uh, did you know that Winston Churchill made several attempts in his life to, to amend the British Constitution? And the big one that was successful was he reduced the power of the House of Lords. He was the leader in that in 1909 to 11 to stop something passed through the House of Commons. Why? People are not born to rule one another. And aristocrats don't get to do that. But then the rest of his life, and at that time too, he always tried to reform the House of Lords so that it had its roots in indirect appointment from the popularly elected House of Commons. He was going to make it into a Senate, like the original American Senate or the Roman Senate. You see? Well, better than the Roman Senate, which was hereditary. And he, he believed in separation of powers. You should hear him argue about how they have it in Britain, whereas Woodrow Wilson always said they don't. And he believed in federalism. He tried to decentralize the government of Britain forever and ever. Why? Because if you delegate power as near as possible to the place where the actual work is done, then, and this is the gift of constitutionalism, the promise of America is that everybody born however they please gets, an, gets to attempt to live a fully human life. You heard what Keith said, right? But he didn't, bring, he didn't mention well-born. 
right? Because if he had, we couldn't get in. And, you know, my wife could, but nobody else could here, you know. <laughs> so, so that's the promise. And the Constitution is the operating rules, the most successful in history that make that promise possible to pursue. The crisis of the West is in this, just a simple little thing. It, it's funny, I've just discovered the third of this. I teach this course on totalitarian novels. If you read Brave New World or 1984 or Darkness at Noon, you gotta read those. It'll scare the daylights out of you. And um, it's, it's, by the way, it's, it's more fearsome and more beautiful than reading the newspaper, which is itself fearsome but not beautiful. <laughs> And uh, what happened was, there was a turn away from this voice that we hear, being human, toward, we got to forget about all that, right? Because we've been, this is Machiavelli, we've been constructing imaginary republics for millennia, and we never get them built. We should just get on with the work. We should just do what's practical. We should just get success. And, and, you know, never mind what is success. <laughs> You'd have to find that out first, right? When you know, you don't. He even claims, and Hobbes claims, and all of them claim, that we actually all know what that is. And it's just whatever we want, right? C.S. Lewis explains in The Abolition of Man, that's Andrew's deal right there, except now maybe it's just the Bible. I don't know. You still read Lewis, right? Um, Andrew's not become an idiot. <laughs> and, and he better not. If, um, um, he explains how, here's what happens. If you, if you just make that choice, right? I'm going to forget about what's right or good. I'm just going to do what works, right? He just explains. It's about a, what, 80 or 90 page book. It's, it's dense, but it's beautiful and gripping and fearsome. He explains how what eventually gets excluded, because now we have all this power. We can remake everything, right? And that just raises more starkly the question, how? How should we do it? Now there's more choices. You get rich. Now it's more important what you do with your money. The money itself doesn't talk to you and tell you what to do with it. See? Everything is like that. Now we got nuclear bombs. That's just a club writ large. But gosh, you can do a lot more with it, huh? What should you do? You see? And if you forget those questions, then here's what's happened. After you take out that voice, the only thing left is the appetite. In other words, that's what the dog's got. The dog just wants to do what he wants to do, or he wants to do what you tell him to do, because he takes direction, or you beat him. I don't know. How many men were civilized by their wives? <laughs> and the answer is, when I'm out of town, it doesn't persist. Um, so we actually take a, a, out of us what makes us us, and we don't exist anymore. Lewis says, and then Churchill says, and then Leo Strauss. This is the part that I had forgotten. But my son-in-law has got me reading. I've got this educated son-in-law. It's very annoying. <laughs> and, uh, and he's got me reading great books, you know, like I never did before. And, uh, and so he sent me this Strauss essay. And it's, it is exactly like C.S. Lewis. He says, the power of man, the absolute power of man over nature means necessarily the power of one or a few over everyone else. If, if, we, if mankind is powerful, that power is going to be at the disposal of a few over everybody else. And then that few or that one, they don't have anything human left in them to guide what they do. If you doubt that's going on now, read the newspaper. Just not every day. 
So now, two questions. You see how these things are related? Right? The West requires constitutionalism. What did Churchill do? What did he tell us about preserving the, the West? There are two things, and one of them is famous and very beautiful. For about a year, Winston Churchill turned Great Britain, a modern, prosperous company, into something approaching Sparta. And I want you to know his whole life, that, that, that quote that I gave you about uh, without improving a preacher of virtue or enjoying wiser guidance, that's from an essay called Shall We All Commit Suicide in 1925. Churchill was desperately afraid of war. And he tried to avoid it all his life. And he thought that the Second World War was just because they wouldn't prepare. Should have been avoided. He won his glory in the war. What shall we call the war, Prime Minister? He said, that's easy. This is the unnecessary war. But once you're fighting it, are you going to make a deal with Adolf Hitler? Because the next thing you know, you're going to be signing orders to pick up Jews, which is what the French did, and every other country that the Nazis occupied. right? And that means that there are Frenchmen today whose, whose, paper, whose, whose names are in the archive. And they emerge once in a while, and their families are mortified. But on pain of death, they did that, you see. Better to die. He says uh, to the cabinet, to the wider cabinet, he says, uh, it's a famous thing, May the 28th, 1940, he saved the country. And just remember how things work, by the way, kids. You should remember it's not trends. It's not these great things that I'm describing that are going to determine the future. It's choices, and they matter, right? Because on the 28th of May, 1940, Winston Churchill walked into the cabinet room with the power to talk. Only one person had that power. There isn't anybody else around who would have used it the way he did. And he had sought that power all his life and only got it then, 18 days before this meeting. And he says, we're going to keep fighting. Most of them didn't want to. He says, I've been thinking in these last few days whether to open negotiations with that man. And I believe that every one of you would rise up and tear me down from my pace if I were for a moment to consider parley or surrender. If this island story is to end at last, let it end when each one of us in this room lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. And they cheered him, see. And that's what shut Edward Halifax up. He did it with a, a speech, right? And the speech described the beauty, and people respond to that, see. Later, he wrote that he wrote a speech. We don't have the speech. He never gave it. But if the, French, if the Germans had landed, the, 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 Britain was going to have to give up London. Couldn't defend the coast, right, because of the way defense works. Because if you try to defend the whole coast, you won't have very many troops in any particular place. The speech is going to be called, you can take one with you. Amazing. And you know, my wife's parents, they were in that war. My wife's father was a camp commander of a Japanese POW camp for three and a half years. My wife's mother was a uh, Royal Air Force plotter. They remember all that. And they remember, they're dead now, but they remembered that as the greatest thing they ever saw. And so the first key to defending the West is to be prepared to fight. The second key is to figure out for what would you fight? And I have a quote to read you, so I have to actually look at I made, you can't tell it, but I made notes for this speech. <laughs> this quote that I'm going to read you, it's about what to do to prepare for the long term. I want you to know that, that, that this quote separates Winston Churchill from just about every statesman of his time up to this, including, I will tell you, most Republicans. February 26, 1946, right after the war, a few days before the Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri. He's at the University of Miami. 
He's given a speech about education. And millions of soldiers are coming home and they're about to be absorbed into the economy. And everybody's talking about getting them jobs, right? Here's what Churchill says. This is also, by the way, the difference between Winston Churchill and Adolf Hitler. This is an age of machinery and specialization. But I hope nonetheless, indeed all the more, that the purely vocational aspect of university study will not be allowed to dominate or monopolize all the attention of the returning service men. Engines were made for men, not men for engines. Mr. Gladstone said many years ago that it ought to be a part of man's religion to see that his country is well governed. Knowledge of the past is the only foundation we have from which to peer into and try to measure the future. Expert knowledge, however indispensable, is no substitute for a generous and comprehending outlook upon the human story with all its, uh, with all its sadness and all its unquenchable hope. He thought that everybody has a right to live a fully human life. And that means everybody has a right to learn what that means. And that they'll never learn anything more important than that. And that's why he saw Adolf Hitler for what he was. And the reason we are weak today is also the reason why we can be strong. We are weak because we have forgotten things like that. It actually crosses the political boundaries now. But look at this. Look at you. Aren't you glad to be here? What do you get for it? Love. Beauty. That will save the West. Thank you. Um, first of all, Andrew, I bet you knew that Winston Churchill offered C.S. Lewis a uh, knighthood. He didn't take it. But we know that there are three things of which I know that he said that are very favorable to Winston Churchill. So we know they liked each other. Uh, you see where the new need for Thumos is written, right? It's written in this mess we're in, right? We are just like an animal. We have needs, we have desires, and yet we have this voice. And we have to address circumstances with a kind of constraint about us. Because, you know, a dog will steal, steal food unless you're standing right there looking at it, right? He won't feel very, very bad about it later. <laughs> and so you need to cope with the world, and sometimes you need to fight the world to do the right thing. And so you need that. And how do you train for that? Well, just what you do, right? In other words, if you grow up in a world richly populated with moral examples and moral truths, and then beyond that, higher truths, then your soul will orient itself. And then uh, boys should always contrive to get into a fist fight at some point when they're growing up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you do, kids should do hard things, right? And uh, because they'll be weenies if they don't. A question here, was Mr. Churchill a Christian? Shall we see him in heaven? Uh, well, those are two separate questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring Father Andrew up. <laughs> there are foolish people who think they know the answer to that first question. We know two things about him. Uh, we know that uh, he expressed profound respect for the Christian religion, treated his country as a Christian nation, uh, thought that uh, Nazism in one of his most important speeches after the Munich Agreement, the speeches on October 5th, 1938, he says that our Christian civilization is itself at stake here. So he also believed in freedom of religion, and like all the best statements, that gave him some reticence about proclaiming his own faith. He did say this thing, which is the most famous thing he said, uh, to say he's not a Christian. He said that, uh, 
I am a pillar of the church. I'm like a flying buttress. I support it from the outside. <laughs> but I think what that, in another place, is, I, think that, I think what that means, by the way, is that, you know, when he was first Lord of the Admiralty, we work six days, and the seventh day is the first Lord's Day. Uh, he, was, he, he worked all the time. And, and uh, he, he said that when he was in school, he went to chapel every day. And then in the military, he went to chapel every day. And he had a credit balance in the Book of Observance. <laughs> <laughs> and he hadn't inquired later, lately how, close, how that balance stood. The next one is going to bring it a little more to the present day with some contemporary issues. Could you share with us your thoughts on the talk about having another constitutional convention? Yeah, I'm against that. Um, and the reason is, uh, first of all, well, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, one is, the things that they propose to do in those conventions won't fix the chief thing, except one, my, my friend Mark Levin, who loves this idea and I don't, he, he's the only one who's got the one thing that would actually do something. And that is the key to the whole situation constitutionally is that we should stop anybody but the Congress of the United States from making any laws and anybody but the President of the United States from enforcing any laws, right? And that, there are tools to do that that are within the scope of ordinary legislation. And it's hard to amend the Constitution. Uh, uh, the people who propose that thing say there have been many, 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 many thousands, millions of constitutional conventions proposed. And I always say, yeah, and any of them get called? And it has been amended 28 times, not by that way. And then another thing is the Constitution is good, right? It was, it's the best of all constitutions. And so why don't we spend our energy restoring it? And uh, that means pass a law that a, a, law, a rule in a bureaucracy is not binding on anybody unless it is ratified by the Congress and signed by the President in six months. That would cripple big government. And that's what needs doing, right? And then, and you know, right now, there's a political fight on in Washington, D.C. about that thing. You know, the, uh, there's a position called the regulatory czar. Well, I hate that name, but not as much as I used to because it's held now by a student of mine. <laughs> and and uh, little Paul Ray, English major, rocket scientist. Um, he... Uh, one has conversations with him, let's say, and he's doing as much of that thing that I just said as it's possible to do without legislation in the Congress. Well, that should be getting support, right? And changing the Constitution, first of all, it isn't going to get done. If it were to get done, do you know a big supporter of that idea is George Soros? And he's got a whole string of amendments he wants to put through, right? And then we'll turn the thing into the Constitution of the European Union, right? Thousand pages. What do you think of the notion that the country is ideologically split beyond repair and should look at dissolving peacefully while it still can? <laughs> well, I moved to the Midwest in in, in, in face of that prospect. <laughs> no, it, it, you know, the, first of all, it is significantly geographic lines, but not simply. It's actually the great divide in America is between sophisticated and the ordinary. Uh, you know, you people involved with this school and Andrew over there and I, we're, you know, if somebody has serious academic credentials and thinks like we do, we know that person. <laughs> you know, there's almost nobody, right? So the point is, there's, you know, that, that's not going to fix it, probably. And just remember, you know, we always forget, what are the constituents of anything, right? Uh, I said that there's a form to the American government. The form is what it looks like and also how it operates when it's fully in being, when it's going to work, and uh, that's, the Constitution is the form. It has an ultimate purpose. 
And that's in the Declaration of Independence, and it's a very beautiful purpose, right? But it also has two other things that have made it what it is. And one is the land, right? It got hold of the most promising land left on the earth, and there's nothing else like that now. And the second thing is the people. And remember what happened in our story. I even think it's part of God's providence, this story, partly because I think everything is, but partly because this is such a big thing. A whole population moved from Europe and brought everything from Europe with them except, except the aristocracy. They brought the Bible. They brought Shakespeare. They bought you know, property. They, bought, they brought everything except they got to start over politically. And that can't happen again. And so give up on that, the last best hope of mankind on Earth? I'm going to combine two. We have um, one who was able to meet and hear from uh, Sir Martin at uh, UC Irvine some years ago in 2006. And he shared a favorite Churchill quote of a number. But he said, if you can't read all your books, um, organize them and put them in their place. Do you have a favorite quote or two from, uh, by the way, that, that commenter uh, thanks you for your uh, eulogy uh, for Sir Martin. And, and um, But can you share with us your thoughts on a lifetime of study with Churchill, some of his favor your favorite maxims or thoughts in this area? And it's combined with a question in a bigger picture, more contemporary, what will save the education system? Uh, well, uh, okay, Churchill. Well, that quote, by the way, is from the only novel Churchill wrote, which is fun reading. You kids should read. It's called Savrola. And what he says in there is that uh, if you have a lot of books and you don't have time to read them, you should take them down and look at them. Uh, uh, if they cannot be uh, your friends, at least they can be familiar to you. Uh, Churchill read a lot of stuff, too. Churchill was amazing. I, I, most of the things that I love about Churchill are all things that I learned with my best teachers and friends and wonder how Winston Churchill figured them out. Well, he was unfair. He was a genius. So what's my favorite quote from Churchill? He describes the Bolsheviks in uh, Mass Effects in Modern Life. And he says that uh, they have... Uh, uh, perfected, and they, they have uh, not perfected anything. They've actually only brought into being the society that was perfected a million years ago by the white ant, uh, which doesn't, because there's no honey, see. Well, then the next sentence is my favorite sentence, he says. Uh, two sentences. But human nature is more intractable than ant nature. It is at once the glory and the safeguard of mankind that it is easy to lead and hard to drive. When I was interviewed uh, to be the president of the college, and I, I got the job because there were 700 people applied, and I was the one who didn't want it. <laughs> so, so I stuck out. But uh, this, uh, this MBA guy on our board founded a big company, makes steel shot for shotgun shells. And he's, you know, trained like a businessman, which I am not. And he said, uh, how did you learn how to manage? And I said, making mistakes and reading. And he said, what would you read? And I said, well, it doesn't count. Peter Drucker used to be my landlord. I said, but I read Churchill and Aristotle. What did Churchill teach you? And I said, easy to lead and hard to drive. That's how you manage. There are people. They live most of their waking lives at their jobs. They want their jobs to be fulfilling. Now, you have to set up the conditions for that, and you have to maintain the power to supervise. But you see, don't you see, by the way, how generous and, and charitable a thing that is to say, like so much that Churchill said, he wished the good of everyone. Thoughts on how we might turn the edu save oh. the education system as well? Well, that's, you know, it, it's like, it, 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 I, I've come to believe uh, that everything in, in uh, education is simple to understand, just hard to do. 
So the answer is here in this room, right? We, we need to, the, the, we have to realize, by the way, how the Constitution is supposed to work because how humans work, right? The proper sovereign over an education, over education, is the school. And the reason is the children are young and not ready yet, and the school is the place where those who know and love them are gathered to help them, parents and teachers. And so if we would just remember that, it's the reason why charter schools are a great idea. Jeff Bark's trying to start one here, and I'm gonna to talk to him after this. And, uh, and you know, we've sponsored 24 of those things now. And they're a great idea because, you know, not fully because it's such a terrible country in the law these days. Uh, it is a step back toward the school being sovereign. And see, I read the flyer that, uh, who's the marketing guy, about the, uh, about the school that we're here to celebrate. Pacifica. <laughs> Pacifica. I was about to call it Carlton, Carlson University. <laughs> anyway, and that thing's beautiful, right? And it, you just read it. It's just, and the thing is, what's in it has been known for as long as there's been organized education, right? So get that back. And, you know, I, I'll say a word here against my friends in the conservative movement of who I'm meant to be a leader. Um, the conservative movement is uh, located heavily in Washington, D.C. now. And they know a great deal about policy. And education policy is not the same thing as education. You know, education is something you do, something you know, something you love, something you carry in your soul. We have to get good at explaining that again, and then refuting the craziness that is put forward as education theory today. And you can only do it with just this. The, the thing that bring everybody in this room today is the entire answer. Just use it. Staying in Washington, D.C. for a contemporary uh, analysis here, could you give us your thoughts, compare and contrast the president with Winston Churchill? Uh, well, they're both stubborn. Uh, well, I, you know, I don't know what you think, and I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I, I like Donald Trump. And that's a, that's a very weird thing for me to say, because I, I know too much about it to know that nobody like him ever got elected president of the United States. But what I like about him is two things. There seems to be an extraordinary consistency in the man, oddly enough. And I discovered that. I remember once one of my friends, you know, didn't go my way about that thing. And I, I didn't endorse Trump till after the primary because I understood it was such a contra controversial thing to do and so uncertain. I thought he was going to win. And I, th I even thought he was going to win the general election. But, uh, but I, I, and I th even thought it would be good he, if he won, but I didn't know that. And why is he good? Well, first of all, this stuff he's been saying about draining the swamp and all that, and that's who's attacking him in Washington right now. You know, maybe it'll be proved that he did some dirty. Uh, I personally doubt it, but that trial's not over yet. And, uh, but that's not the motive behind it, right? The motive behind it is, uh, if you want to understand it, read William Barr, who I think is a heroic man. He, he was asked on CBS News, he's written a beautiful thing, and he gave a speech at Notre Dame, where some students from Pacifica have made the mistake of going. <laughs> and, and, uh, that won't happen again. <laughs> yeah, that's a, there we go. <laughs> we're, we're all over that now, aren't we, kids? <laughs> but uh, um, it's very beautiful. It's about the decay in America. And then he gave this speech at the Federalist Society the other day, and it contains an entirely uncontroversial, simply factually true statement of the way the executive is described in the Constitution of the United States. And he gave a beautiful summary of it, right? But it's not controversial. And the headline in the Washington Post the next day is, what planet is William Barr living on? And then this uh, jackass, excuse me, no, I don't, excuse me. This jackass who writes for uh, Slate magazine. And by the way, kid, jackass, that's a reference to a stubborn donkey, right? 
he writes in Slate magazine. He writes like he might be an educated man, but he can't be. Because he says, he says, you know, William Barr's speech is, you know, three or 4,000 words long. You can read it in 20 minutes. He says that William Barr describes the presidency as a monarchy. He denies that, William Barr, three times in the speech, right? So how can you write something for the national world to read that bears no resemblance to an easy, checkable fact? And to wrap up, uh, maybe something to think about for the parents, the grandparents, the supporters of the school as we look to train the young and the generation to come. I'm um, question about how was it that Churchill was able to identify the threat in his time, in his society, to the things that we hold near and dear? How would a good statesman prepare? How would a good person train to be able to see the threat before it's too late? Well, the, the bad news about that is uh, Winston Churchill didn't go to college. And uh, it's not fair. He was a genius. But he did prepare in the way that one prepares. He read the best books. Also some bad ones, by the way. But he read the best ones. And he could read. And they stuck with him. Uh, late in his life, his very close friend, Effie Smith, late in his life, in his mature years, sent him uh, a copy of Aristotle's Ethics, which he had read a long time ago, and he read it again. He said, so interesting, uh, Freddie Birkenhead, he called him Freddie. He said, so interesting, he said, amazing how much I already knew. <laughs> See, <laughs> so the point is, you prepare by, you know, you start where these kids are starting. It's such a mistake, by the way, too, you know, I have a text today from a good friend of mine who's a conservative activist and a donor to the college. And darned if he doesn't want me to give to the whole student body some program from Glenn Beck aired in the last four or five days because they need to know it urgently right now. Well, you know, the only thing they need to know urgently right now is stuff that never changes. Then they can become excellent choosers and leaders and fighters and teachers. Only then. And that's what your business is now. And it's blessings on you to get to do that because it's the best thing you could be doing at any time in life.